and it's time for me to introduce the, the international keynote speaker who's actually told me to explain that she has an Australian accent. <laughs> uh, the next speaker will speak about wishing upon a star, making crowdsourcing in cultural heritage a reality. And Mia Rich, you work at the library, British Library, and you have worked in museums and libraries for a long time. And that's how you became interested in crowdsourcing. And we are so interested and so happy to have you here. So the stage is yours. Thank you. OK. Um, so what I wanted to look at, you've heard a lot about crowdsourcing already today and over the years. So I wanted to think about what it is that's required to make crowdsourcing work in reality. Um, you often hear about the star projects, the ones that have done really well. Um, but lots of projects don't necessarily do so well. So I wanted to think about definitions of success, but also think about the work that's required to make a good crowdsourcing project. Um, and I'm looking forward to your questions. And I'm also looking forward to hearing about the barriers you might face in your institutions in getting crowdsourcing projects up and running. Um, and also, I'd love examples that you might have to share of crowdsourcing projects that you know about, because I think we have a lot to learn from how different projects succeed. OK, a quick definition. Um, unlike commercial crowdsourcing uses, using services like Mechanical Turk, crowdsourcing in cultural heritage doesn't provide tangible or financial rewards. So the activity has to be inherently rewarding. That might be because the task is really enjoyable, or it might be because you're contributing to a goal um, that matters. You're doing something that makes a positive difference in the world. So a lot of the work around motivations and task design are based around the idea that people have to want to take part. It's volunteering. You can't make people take part. Thinking about it as volunteering um, is a really, uh, it's a good way to think about it because many of us have worked with um, volunteers in the past. You might have people who come into your building somewhere, they sit in a basement um, or they work out in the stores, they help you organise, catalogue, transcribe your material. Crowdsourcing and cultural heritage uses technology, but the same drivers apply. And the reason I've chosen an image with people is that it's the community, it's the conversations, it's the feeling of working together with others that often lasts as a motivation longer than um, the enjoyment around tasks. So people have different reasons for starting with a project and for continuing with the project. And community, that sense of solidarity, that sense of working together is a really important part of why people continue to contribute to projects. Um, and often it helps us to think about what we know about working with people in reality and worry less about the technology. Um, but there are some points at which technology really matters and I'll discuss those later. So you've heard some examples of crowdsourcing already with things like photographs. Um, often crowdsourcing projects are designed to be using micro tasks, so little tiny tasks that you can complete quite quickly. Um, that can be a challenge because we might be looking at transcribing whole pages of text and then the idea is to break that down into smaller tasks. Um, so this is an example from Family Search. They were exploring whether they could get people to transcribe um, family history records on their mobile devices. Their example was someone waiting in a queue for a restaurant who might um, transcribe some text. But you can see that's quite challenging because you've got to fit a keyboard on the screen. Um, it's hard to see examples of the handwriting. But the idea is that it's little tiny things and you can possibly do several of these tasks in a minute. And again, I wanted to make the point that Technology has enabled crowdsourcing as we know it now. Um, this is an example from the Oxford English Dictionary where they realised that actually writing something like a dictionary of the English language is quite a large task. Um, so they opened up to members of the public through various appeals to the reading public. And people wrote in with um, these slips of paper on which they'd written the word and the example of the earliest usage they could find. So it might be a reference to the particular book. Um, this is James Murray. He used to live in Oxford. Um, all those bits of white paper behind him are those individual slips. So the task of managing, deduplicating, verifying um, each of these entries was obviously 
a much harder task before we had computers. Now computers mean that we can reach um, through Facebook messages or through Twitter or through writing to community archives. You can reach the few people who are interested in your subject really easily, no matter where they are in the world, no matter what time of day or night it is. You can validate their entries. You can work at scale in a way that wasn't possible without digital technologies. But the same basic processes apply. Who's working with you? Why do they want to work with you? What are they sending you? How do you know that you can trust them? How do you get something that's of benefit to both parties? You're probably all familiar with the images of scale, but just to remind us why we need to do this. Um, the British Library in particular has about 200 million collection items. When you break that down, that's a lot of individual pages. Um, and we've already heard about some other examples of very large collections. Um, we can't possibly transcribe these. And governments aren't necessarily very interested in giving us money to digitize things. So we're looking for creative ways to digitize material, to make it more discoverable, um, these are the newspaper stores in Boston Spa, our site in Yorkshire. Um, there are more newspaper pages than we could ever possibly look at as a library. Um, so we're looking at how can we involve people in the process of helping digitise material. Because even if we scan it and use software to transcribe it, that depending on the age of the newspaper, the transcription itself is full of errors, and of course, handwritten text, images, are much harder to process computationally at the moment, although technologies are improving all the time. So if we're ever going to make this material accessible to the public that we hold it for and who've helped pay for it, um, and whose trust we hold it in, then we need to do something to uh, speed up the process of making it accessible. So you've probably heard about these sort of famous crowdsourcing projects. And I wanted to think about three ways of defining success um, and also introduce some of these star projects. So this is a transcription or a um, correction, um, newspaper correction project from the National Library of Australia, um, where you can, as you're reading through historical newspaper collections, if you spot a typo, if you spot something where the optical character recognition hasn't succeeded in transcribing the word correctly, then you can correct it. Um, it's a really satisfying task to do because you get the sense, particularly when you transcribe someone's name or a place name is here, that you've helped make something more discoverable. So someone's name that wasn't legible to a computer suddenly becomes searchable and you can imagine that someone somewhere will be grateful for that act. Um, they also make it really easy to see what changes have been made. So. If a group of school kids did decide to vandalise a historical newspaper collection, which is probably pretty unlikely, um, you can go in and you can see what changes they've made and then you can revert them. So the user will trust that the transcriptions are valid and are correct. Um, every time I look at this project, they've gotten a bit further ahead. When I looked um, over the weekend, they had 225 million lines of transcribed text. They also have lots of other kinds of user contributions on their site. But it's one of those projects where we start to talk in the millions or the hundreds of millions when we're thinking about how productive the project has been. Another way of thinking about success is thinking about how many people you've reached. Um, the Zooniverse projects, which tend to be citizen science projects, so looking at galaxies or looking at natural history, but they also have some humanities text-based projects. They have reached, in 2014, they'd reached a million volunteers. So that kind of scale, that reach, um, this map shows where their volunteers are around the world. And you can see that not only it maps to um, densely populated places, but it also maps to places where internet connectivity, um, English language is more widely spoken. There are all kinds of reasons why there might be barriers to someone accessing your project. Um, the more that we can do with translation systems and mobile accessible systems, the more people that we can reach with these kinds of projects. But reach isn't only about numbers, it's also about what people are doing, how it's changing their lives. Um, so for my doctoral research, I got really interested in sort of unpacking um, engagement. It's a word that museums and libraries and archives like to throw around a lot, um, but what does it actually mean? It's, if we think about how does someone's behaviour change as a result of their encounter with cultural heritage. So in this example, um, it's a quite early example from about 2006, people looking at natural history specimens, so looking at herbaria specimen sheets, um, 
which were about 100 and 150 years old. They got really interested in the handwriting. They'd realised that they'd see the same handwriting on specimen sheets again and again, and realised that they were looking at the traces of activity of actual people, so Victorian collectors, going out, collecting ferns, collecting other kinds of specimens. Um, then they started to realise that not only could they plot um, whereabouts people tended to collect, whether they collected on the weekends or the weekdays, and what that told them about whether it was a leisure activity or whether um, it was someone who didn't need to work. Um, the, they could look at the impact of the rail on the accessibility of natural history, so people could, who lived in towns could easily get out to the countryside. Um, and then they started doing biographical research, so looking up the names of these collectors in census records, birth, death, marriage records, um, and realising that sometimes they were members of the same family who might go out collecting. Sometimes they might be a father and a daughter. Um, they might be brothers. So people who started working on a project because they were interested in natural history ended up teaching themselves basic historical skills so that they could research the lives that they were uncovering as a result of their exposure to this material. So it's just an example of the ways in which engagement works in cultural heritage crowdsourcing. Um, so in looking at some example projects, I've broken them down into four main areas. One is a fairly simple sort of type what you see. You look at the screen and then you just type in what it is you're looking at. Others are describe what you see. Um, share what you know. So perhaps if someone knows where a petrol station was in Norway, they can share that knowledge too. Um, and then there's a newer method um, where we're validating the inputs of other people, or it might be validating the inputs of software. Um, another example, a project with millions of contributors. In this case, the motivation often relates to family history, which is a very deep driver, it drives a lot of behavioural change, drives a lot of activity. But also in the case of family search indexing, there's a religious motivation for some participants as well. Um, this is their beta web indexing interface. So they used to have downloadable software um, that about 1.4 million volunteers have used to help digitise historical records. They focus very much on birth, death, marriages, those kinds of things that help family historians. Um, and in this case, you, as long as you can read handwriting, which isn't necessarily a given, um, then you can transcribe. For some people these days, learning to read handwriting is actually a challenge and that becomes quite enjoyable for them because it's something that doesn't come that easily but feels achievable, so it's a kind of nicely positioned challenge. But you can also transcribe text that you can't read. So this is an example of um, ancient papyri text in um, ancient Greek. Um, when I first looked at this, I kind of went, this is actually really hard. And then the next time I looked at it, I found myself, I think it was about 2 a.m., I was suddenly like, oh, I'm learning ancient Greek without realising it. Because um, they teach you how to sort of pattern match. You're finding characters that look like the characters that they give you as examples. So you don't even need to speak the language to be able to do some of this work. And again, I found that quite engaging. I didn't think that ancient Greek was something that was accessible to someone like me. And then we have examples like Flickr and Flickr Commons, um, which are kind of low end as projects go. They're not specifically designed around crowdsourcing, but they have platforms that have affordances like comments and tags that allow people to add information. Um, so in this example, we see people who are both describing what they see, they're adding tags that describe it's a woman, it's a portrait, um, there's lace. But then someone's also shared what they know. So they've said, this is my relative, they've given other names, um, they've given a sort of brief biographical information about this woman. Um, it's not necessarily possible to tell from that comment whether this person is correct in their identification, but because they've left a comment the institution that posted the image can get in contact with them and ask them more. They might be able to supply other images, they might be able to supply family history records that would help verify their claim. Which means the act of posting this image has suddenly unlocked a wealth of information about just one single collection item. The odds of that happening are sort of difficult to calculate because the right person with the right knowledge has to see the right image um, and that's why it's tricky but it does happen sometimes. Another example, um, artworks are quite good to crowdsource because 
nearly anyone can say something about an artwork. There's a visceral response, you can respond to the aesthetics, you can describe what's depicted. This project is looking at um, artworks held in, by public institutions in the UK. So they've collected images of all these um, artworks and then asked people to describe them using tags that are quite specific, so structured in terms of people, places, um, and then they have an expert interface where people who have identified as art historians can talk about genre, about the artists, um, about style and other sort of more specialist aspects. The project then took this data that was um, describing their collections and used it to drive some machine learning. So we're seeing more and more institutions using things like machine learning where you give a computer a set of images. So in this case, they gave them the um, tags and they gave them the images and they said to the computer, go away and learn what's going on here. Um, so it's a quite open-ended process um, based on data created by people. And then the computer scientists made this interface where you could really quickly go through and verify whether the tags that the computer had guessed were actually accurate. Um, so in this case, um, it was looking at sideburns. And it was kind of interesting because um, it loads about 50 images at a time. You click once if it's definitely not a sideburn. You click twice if you're not sure. So it's either green, red, or yellow. It's really quick. Um, but I found myself in this kind of, what is a sideburn? Like, at what point does a bit of hair on the side of your face become a sideburn. It's that kind of thing that computers don't have to worry about, but is actually quite tricky when it comes down to it. Um, so it's quite an enjoyable task because it's quick. You get to see a whole bunch of portraits. Which is a, it's a different way of experiencing a collection. Um, so more and more we're seeing this kind of validation where people and machines are working together to improve the data that they're collecting. And the fact that I've gone through and tagged these things as maybe not being sideburns then goes back into the system um, and it tries to refine its understanding of what a sideburn actually is. We're also seeing people invent tasks. So sort of things like categorizing, describing, transcribing, they're quite traditional tasks that would have been done in archive offices 100 years ago. Um, this is a project from the Portable Antiquities Scheme and the British Museum where you trace around images of um, Bronze Age finds and they use those to build, to build 3D models. Um, so it's an entirely new usage of the fact that as humans, we're really good at pattern recognition. We're really good at understanding 2D representations of 3D objects. So we're helping the computer understand a 3D object. Um, and then they can feed those into things like Sketchlab um, and you can print out versions of these objects and use those for teaching or use those for understanding how they worked. Okay, so that's the kind of the amazing, you know, there are all these things that we can do. But in the real world, it's a balancing act. So you have to balance the project structure, the goals that you have, um, your organisational structure, how you put a project together, how you think about sustainability. You have to balance the needs of marketing and outreach. Um, and then you have to balance user experience design at the micro level, so the task design level. All of those things need to come together to make a successful project. It can't only be a technology project. It can't only be a cataloging project. It needs to involve people from across the institution thinking hard about how to make this succeed. And the first step is really understanding why it is that people take part. So I break it down into three sort of broad groups of motivations. Um, altruistic, a lot of people just wanted to do something. They know that history is important, um, perhaps particularly at the moment, a sense of where we've come from, a sense of how can we understand the world better, how can we have more tolerance and empathy for other people um, can be an important driver. Uh, for some people, the sense of they've benefited from the work that others have done in the past, so they want to give something back, they'll spend some time volunteering in the sense that they're paying it forward. Um, for others, you know, reading 18th century handwriting or even reading 20th, 20th century handwriting um, is a puzzle that we don't have to deal with all the time. So it's quite enjoyable to kind of sit through and just read through a couple of lines of text because it's a bit like crosswords or Sudoku. It's that sense of um, something that's enjoyable for its own sake. And then you get people who might be transcribing for other reasons. Um, so they're paid. A lot of American projects actually um, use prisoners. Um, or they, we do a lot of public-private partnerships, someone, so someone is being paid to do these kinds of things. But increasingly we find that 
while your first job out of university might have been working as a digitization assistant, those roles don't exist anymore because we don't have the funding to run those kinds of projects. So once you understand the motivations, then you use those as design principles. Um, and Jane McGonagall, who's actually a games designer, has a neat way of looking at it. And I just find that she's summed up quite well what I spent about a year reading in terms of the psychological literature. Um, so people want satisfying work to do, something that has some meaning outside of the task itself. They like the chance to master something. So mastering 18th century handwriting is a great challenge. And then if you can manage that, then you can move on to 17th century handwriting. And then if you can do that, then give 16th a go. Um, they sort of successively get harder as you go back in time because conventions change. Um, people like spending time with people that they like. So if you are someone with a sort of very niche hobby and then you find other people on the internet who like that same thing, whether it's collecting a particular kind of toy, whether it's rail history, no matter what you like, there are other people out there who like the same thing. And if you can come together, it's really fun to discuss it with people who get where you're coming from and why you find it enjoyable and who think it's also important. And the chance to be part of something bigger. So the sense that particularly the luxury that we have in working in cultural heritage is that our work generally always does contribute to something better. We don't leave work thinking, well, what difference have I made in the world today? Even if it's a tiny difference, you've probably helped make the world a slightly better place. That's not the same for all jobs. So lots of people who might have an interest in history, they might have an interest in art, they might have an interest in the kinds of topics that museums and libraries and archives can speak to. Their day job might be in retail, it might be in a bank, they might find that they can be fulfilled by doing something like this outside of their working hours. Okay, so then how do we actually get to the point where people turn up? It can be hard if you don't work in marketing or you don't work in education or outreach to realize how much time you need to spend planning, how much time you need to spend looking for existing communities online who might be working on similar things. If you work in a local institution, there might be groups who are doing local history or family history or working on particular kinds of um, aspects of your collections who could be your biggest allies if you find them and you invite them to join you in the process and if you're willing to learn from them and to help fit in with their goals. And it's a negotiation. It's a process that takes time. And once you've had those conversations or looked for those groups, then you can invite them in and you can also plan to reach people um, who hadn't realised that they had an interest in these things, or how can you interest local school groups, how can you interest people in retirement homes in these kinds of projects. But the time that you put into planning the invitation really pays off. One reason that I say design is important is when you launch a project, people who like crowdsourcing, people who like transcribing text, people who like working on local history or family history, they'll come and check out your project They've seen lots of other projects and they will compare your project to others that they've seen and they'll go back to their forums and they'll review it um, and they'll say, oh, I like the fact that they said they showed you how the information was being used or I didn't like the fact that they didn't publish the licence, so you know, am I giving my work to a commercial entity? Some people are really savvy about these projects, so spending time looking at other people's sites as well as sort of doing open betas or open alphas is a great way to... Um, make sure the project that you launch is the best project that it can be. And one project that's done this really well is the New York Public Library's What's in the Menu project. A lot of academic projects I see have a great amount of text at the start because academics like text and they think that everyone else will read through seven paragraphs and find the tiny little link in the fourth paragraph that says, come and start this project. NYPL literally have hands pointing to the place that you go and get started. Help transcribe. Um, they show you other things that you can do. So they're showing you the menus that have already been digitized and transcribed. So what they're saying is we value your input. The things that you do make a difference. We're noticing as an institution what's happening. It doesn't kind of go away into a black hole and maybe eventually emerge. Um, so there are lots of things that they do really well. Um, they have a help review process where you can, as you said in the past, um, you can look at transcriptions that other people have added and check them that they're okay. For some people, that kind of correction task is really enjoyable. So 
if you have those kinds of people in your community, invite them in to help you. It means that there's less work for your curators, your catalogers, whoever, to review that work. Um, this is a project that we're working on. It's transcribing um, playbills, mostly 17th century, but uh, some 18th century and 19th century playbills as well. So these are kinds of ads for upcoming theatre productions. Designing a task that's the right size is really hard, and we're kind of struggling with this at the moment. So um, there's a process of marking up the text. You can mark up names, actors, dates, places. We're deciding at the moment whether we give people how we give people the smallest possible task. Um, so even if I've been working in this area for a long time, it's still tricky when it comes to new material. You have to understand the range of material that you have. You have to understand what people are going to find enjoyable. So I'm hoping that um, people who work on family history will appreciate the importance of names and they'll be highly motivated to mark up names. People who like theatre history or people who like their local history might just want to go through and mark up places and dates and help make things more discoverable in that way. And then the complication is that we, um, to put this material in the library catalogue, it has to kind of fit with Mark. Um, so it has to fit with library cataloguing standards in ways that make sense to displaying it in the search results in the catalogue. But we also want historians to use it. So we're trying to find the balance between what historians will want to use and that kind of discoverability um, aspect in the catalogue. And the reason that it's important is that the more complex your task or the more tedious your task, um, in the case of the playbills, it might be there's a really dense page of names and it can take a long time to just mark up the page of names, let alone transcribe them. Um, the smaller the audience um, becomes when it gets more complex and when it gets harder to do and when it gets trickier, when you have to make more decisions, you might find that you get some super volunteers who are really dedicated to the task. They love the complexity. They find the tedium kind of rewarding in a strange way. Um, but simple, quick tasks will get you a very wide range of participants. Um, and sometimes that's what you need in a project. Lots of people doing things quite quickly. One way around um, having lots of different things that need to be done to complete a record is to break them down again um, into smaller parts. So again, this is New York Public Library. They're really good at designing tasks. They spend time on it. They really care about it. Um, so they have broken the task of reviewing um, fire um, insurance company records and maps into the tiniest possible task. So in one, if there's any text, then you type it in. In another, you just... Um, enter the, the numbers. In another, you check the colour, which is colour coding according to um, what kind of building it was. These are tiny tasks. You can do 20 in a minute or so. Um, so they get a lot of information really quickly and then they combine the information they've got from these different interfaces into sort of one sense of what's happening in a particular map. So they do a lot of work in the back end to make the task that the user sees as simple as possible, which means it's as, as enjoyable as possible. Another thing that you can do if you have complex material, if you have material that might be quite information dense, is to make a virtue of it. Um, so this is the Smithsonian Transcription Centre. They have a neat way of breaking things into the smallest possible project. So they each field notebook or each um, set of documents becomes a project in itself which means that they can describe them in quite a level of detail. So they can talk about the places, the names, the language. Um, so each one of them, it's kind of like a little hook. So you might be thinking, oh, um, I hadn't really thought about how Estonians in America experience the West, but here's the diary of an Estonian who was on the California Gold Rush Trail. Um, or you might think, you might be interested in the natural history, the kinds of specimens that a scientist was finding. Or you might be interested in bumblebees that are found in Dakota. So each of these tiny descriptions for these little projects means there's a hook. Um, so rather than saying it's a collection of photos of all of Norway, and you're like, okay, but if you said petrol stations, there are some people who'll be like, I love petrol stations. When I drive my family around, I always point out interesting petrol stations. Finally, I've found my petrol station friends. Um, and you can't underestimate the impact of that kind of community. One thing that institutions often find challenging is that 
unlike exhibitions or unlike book projects or television broadcasts, you can't just launch a project and then leave it. People will come in, they'll see it, they'll make suggestions. Sometimes they'll see things that were really obvious and you can't believe that you didn't see them. And you have to keep back some resources and some energy to make those changes and improve the project. Sometimes their suggestions might be really far away from what you're thinking the project was about, but it might be an interesting direction or it might be something that you say, we'll publish the data. If you want to get involved in this, then um, please go away and go for it, but we can't resource that particular aspect of development right now. But you have to be there to be in that conversation um, and ideally keep back some money and some um, development resource, make sure that your contracts allow for fixes. It's not just to kind of launch it and forget it that we're used to, it's an ongoing project. And another thing that people find tricky is you're hosting people in your institution, you have to be hospitable. You can't just say, aren't you lucky that we're letting you transcribe our records? You have to be there in the conversation. Um, and again, the Smithsonian Project does that really well. So they tweet, they're on different social networks, they're engaging people in conversation, they're saying, tell us what you found. When you find something, they're actually genuinely really excited for you. So that makes everyone feel good about what they're doing. Um, but that does take a lot of work. So the benefit is that people whose work is recognised, people who feel that their work is being taken seriously by an institution, will keep going. Because at some point, transcribing handwriting gets a bit boring, you know how it works. But thinking more about what's going on in the records, conversing with others is a great way to keep motivation sustained over the longer term. Which is all great, but then you need to think about what do your staff need? And we sort of haven't done so well in this necessarily in institutions. If you're saying to your staff, you thought that you were recruited as a curator, um, but now we're asking you to engage in conversation. That's not necessarily a core skill for some curators or catalogers um, weren't recruited for their ability to be chatty and constructive online. Um, so we need to think about how do we support our staff in managing these conversations, in being the public face of an institution when that role has changed. I don't have the answers for this, but I think just planning for it and being aware that if you're asking people to take on extra work, that is going to come at some kind of cost and thinking about how you're supporting them, that's important. And then the final stage, and it's a kind of tip of the iceberg, um, particularly for big institutions, um, your cataloguing systems might have begun, in our case, 150 years ago or even earlier. A lot of our material is still only in print. We have lots of different cataloguing systems. We have lots of different cataloguing standards. We have um, things that are designed for public access in a kind of general get things to the reading room way, but we're also having to think about what does it mean to access a section of a page um, using newer technologies like AAAF. What does it mean when material is online, digitised, it becomes a different kind of thing. Um, so th this is an early project for the library which was geo-referencing our map collection. We've only just got the catalogue now to show the records that have come from this because our catalogue deals with books. Um, it deals with the book as a thing that you order to a reading room. It doesn't deal with a section of a page which is a map, which is in a chapter, which is in a book. It, the cataloging system didn't really know about pages, even though it's a cataloging system for books. So we've had to try and think about what are the parts of a book that we might want to address in a crowdsourcing project. Um, because we had amazing data coming back from the georeferencer about some of the maps um, within books and some of the maps that were kind of maps in their own right. So that's my... Um, sort of the final point, think about how you're going to use the data. And then if you make a successful project, at some point you're going to run out of material. So think about how the project ends. Don't just say, OK, thanks everyone, bye. Because hopefully you've created a community of people who are interested and passionate about what you do. So think about where they can go next, how you can involve them in your next project. Or maybe the library down the road or the library in the next country has a similar project. Um, people want to get involved in and you can send them over to join your colleagues. So on that note, I'll just say thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mia.
And I'm quite sure that there will be a lot of questions. You have a question as well for the audience. I do. Please wait with that one. So any questions? We have five minutes. Come on. <laughs> but this is this is a success story. You haven't had any obstacles at all? Not like oh, tiny gazillions, little problems? Gazillions. I mean, it's, it has taken like five years to get georeference material back into the catalogue because there's a lot of institutional stages to go through and um, our systems aren't designed for external input. They're designed for catalogers who have been trained in the various standards that we use, who are cataloging to very specific field formats. And then we're saying, hey, we can give you 27 names of people and the roles that they played and the theatre that they played those roles in. Um, that doesn't really fit into the catalogue, it doesn't fit into the discoverability systems that we have. So it's a lot of conversations about how we deal with that kind of material. And also thinking about um, other methods of machine learning and things that are going to give us... We're going to be getting more data back than we've ever had to deal with before. We're going from a scarcity model to an abundance model. And for the library that means really deep conversations about how we can best use that material. We, uh, we've been talking Swedish before, and the National Librarian said that most of the systems in Sweden, they're actually meant for librarians, not for the, for the users. And um, I think that's what you've been working with as well. Uh, crowdsourcing is all about people. That's something to remember, I think. <laughs> and you still have two minutes for a question from the audience. Otherwise, we will keep you busy during lunch with a question. Yes, please. And could you please repeat the question? Yeah. Now, so the recorded. question was, how do you reach the end users or how do you spread the word? Um, I like to start with existing communities because for any part of your collection, there is someone who's really passionate about it already. Um, the other day, someone randomly said, oh, you work at the British Library. I am with the Waterloo Army Foundation. And they are a group of people who really focus on the history of the Battle of Waterloo. Um, and the armies who are involved in the Battle of Waterloo, and they're like, why doesn't the library ever ask us for input? And it's like, I would love to ask you for input. We don't have a Waterloo project, but you guys are collecting incredibly detailed information, so if we had a way of you depositing back, that would be amazing. People don't always come up to you and tell you what they're doing, but if you search, then you can find people who are looking at your collection of swords or people who are looking at your documents. Um, so finding existing networks, talking to the frontline staff, like reference desk staff or the people who handle the inquiries is a great way to find out what are people interested in, what are people asking about, what do people get grumpy about not being able to do, because sometimes that's a great way to find a community of people who'd like to help do something as well. That's a really important question, thank you. Okay, I think everyone's hungry. But you have a question for the audience. Yes, yeah, so as you know, more and more we're um, getting crowdsourcing data, we're getting these sort of big partnership projects. Um, you might be transforming your data into the Europeana data model. You might be getting enhanced records back from um, entity recognition, named entity recognition. Um, or you might be getting records back from commercial partnerships who've worked with you to digitize material. So what's the one simple, or what's the one concrete thing that you could do to ingest information that comes back from external organisations into some kind of core system so that we get systems that are designed for users and not only designed for librarians? So that's my challenge, just one concrete step for each of you. So this is all our uh, challenge, I guess. So the question is, how do you use metadata from... Eh, människor som inte jobbar i institutioner själva. Så metadata som kommer utifrån, om jag lyckas översätta det här nu rätt, med reservation för att jag kan ha missförstått det redan. Men uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, each one of us will pick one of those, whatever it's called, uh, on our way to lunch. And then we will solve this problem during lunch and we will meet again <laughs> at one o'clock sharp. With all the answers. Thank you, thank Nina. You.